welcome to the Donahue Group. We're delighted you could join us for another half hour of conversation about local and county politics and events and fun things happening around town. I'm Mary Lynn Donahue, the host of this fine uh, group, or at least I try to be the host. Sometimes I lose control. Let and you me go. think it's a fine group. <laughs> <laughs> Generally a fine group, not always. Um, the king of the Harlequin romance series, uh, uh, Ken Risto, also a social studies teacher with the Sheboygan County School District. That is a gorgeous sweater. And Sheboygan County? I mean, Sheboygan I, area, excuse me. Okay. I was the, the, the colors of the sweater are just promotion. so dazzling that I can't. Thank you very much. It's fall. It's beautiful. It's fall. It's beautiful. You sat in your chair, you'd almost disappear. It's the there you color. go. Also garbed in a lovely colors today, Tom Paneski, professor of mathematics at UW Sheboygan. Team sweater vest. There we go. <laughs> it's the sweater vest boys. I'm telling you, they coordinated this in advance. Cal Potter looking just really sober and quiet. <laughs> Former state senator. Mostly sober. <laughs> no Mogan David on the set, so we're doing fine. In any event, I think we'll have a good discussion today. There's lots of stuff going on around town. I'm going to start with the good news. My own personal best good news, 7th Street and 9th Street are now two-way traffic. And I'm having a great time tootling down. It's a complete turnover in the gestalt, the world view, mm -hmm. the, what's another word, Professor? Weltschauung? There we go. Um, the German word for yes. Sheboygan? Uh, uh, it's um, just kind it's of different. Fun. <laughs> it's different. I like no stop lights. Oh, and isn't it great not You just have to stop and then go, you know. You have to wait for the light to change. So that's kind of I, know, nice. I always used to do a little meditation at the corner of 7th and Center because I never ever made that light as I was going west on Center and it was a minute. And of course there would be no cars <laughs> going down 7th Street. So I just kind of commune with nature for 45 seconds or whatever. But I think it's, it's good news. Seems to me there's a lot happening downtown. The um, Hotel in the parking lot, which name escapes me, the Grand Stay. Mm -hmm. Are you talking about mm -hmm. the old Executive Inn building? No, no. Um, the new one. The, the new, new one, one that they're building in the parking oh, lot. On oh, and yes. I'm sorry. That seems to be going great guns. All right. And uh, as does Landmark, is really rising from the ashes, as it were. And so looks like there's good stuff going on downtown. So. Any other personal best stories for Sheboygan? I got to attend Michael Feldman's What Do You Know at the Wild Side. I was there too. Were, were you there? I yes. didn't see you. Oh, yes. It was Wouldn't great. It. it was a okay. great, great time. Yes, it was. So Sheboygan, and uh, he did uh, a good 15 minutes. He almost minutes. sounded like he was from Sheboygan. He was that familiar with the, yes. the local nuances. Yes, and brought uh, Ruth Kohler on stage. Mm -hmm. and she did a nice job. And Larry, was it Williams, the surfer? Yep. That was fun. So they had a nice, and then they had finished a course with Bratwurst. Yeah. from Miesfeld. Which I understand were thrown into the audience. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yep. Somebody got absolutely. a pickle, somebody got an onion. Somebody's seat yeah. got ketchup on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's also a good exhibit at the Art Center on uh, a variety of artists who uh, are, I guess, I don't know what the name of the artists are called. Self-taught called. artists. Self-taught artists. Environment so, builders. Yeah. yeah. And it's worth uh, walking through, taking a peek to see what some of these people have done. Yeah, it is a remarkable exhibit. So I've been living at the Arts Center lately, so it's, uh, it's really fun. I uh, also went to the first family um, uh, presentation they're doing on uh, family cultural values, not values, um, just cultural stuff. I'm sorry, I'm very inarticulate here, but it was on uh, Indian culture. And they mm. had Indian dancers and food and workshops. They're going to be doing a Hispanic one, I think, in February. Um, and um, uh, one more uh, among one, I believe, in May. So again, the Arts Center is just one of those really incredible institutions that just keeps the community ticking on. By now, I'm sure that you're sick of our Pollyanna-ish ap approach. <laughs> <laughs> what's so wrong with your boy? <laughs> <laughs> no, what's wrong? It's fall. We're about to hunker. We're about to hunker it's down Christmas into our so homes in winter and never to be seen again. Yeah. So it's nice to get out and about and do things. Cal, start complaining about the roundabouts or the rotaries. Well, I went through it today for the first time. Um, 
I guess I'm somewhat sympathetic to them because I do think they keep track of traffic moving and being an environmentalist. You should probably uh, tell they, us where which ones you're talking well, about. Well, I, I went through the one that the double uh, circles at I-43 and 42. Okay. And uh, the challenge will be for people to be slow for one thing going through and second to know where they're actually going because you go from one circle to the next. It's automatic, like it's going through a figure eight. And you do have to know where you're going to go. And, um, and watch out for trucks because they do consume a lot of space going around those curves. So I think you're going to see a lot of letters to the editor for a while for people. You know, we're, we're such a uh, right angle type of uh, society <laughs> and that uh, perpendicular is just stuck in well, people's yeah. minds. Uh, and these things, you know. People this are is, right angle people. I think right so. Angle. Americans are. And I think the circular uh, routes are going to be a challenge for people for a while. Well, I, 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 the website, Sheboygan Press has a website, and they had a video, so some young lady was no. doing a little uh, report on the, uh, the, uh, those circles and said, well, we did have one minor accident. One of those big semis took off the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> took off the uh, side view mirror of a car, got too close and took it off. So. Oh, really? Yeah. See, I'm a particular fan. So that would be interesting if there's more minor accidents mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Of the 8th Street Rotary, um, yeah. I lived on the south side of town for a little while, and um, always going through 8th and, and Indiana, and I never liked the stoplight. We were always turning left, you know, do you get in this lane, do you get in that lane, yada, yada. And so I think that's an extremely efficient way of keeping mm -hmm. traffic moving around there. And I know there's always a fear that if a lot of people had to leave the south, um, not South Park, had to leave the South Pier area, uh, traffic would be really terribly jammed up. But I think, by and large, the 8th Street one does a nice job. Now, I have not been out to see the, that. The 8th Street one doesn't have huge semis making the oval, where mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Out, at the, uh, t out at 42 and I-43, you're going to have a lot of semis. So I don't know how the semis are going to you know, mm -hmm. fit into this. Uh, well, I lived in Boston briefly years and years ago. And of course, everything is a rotary in, in, in the Boston area. And they go fast, <laughs> and they're not yeah. polite, and they don't, I mean, Midwest drivers, I think, really are quite polite, and they don't, uh, they don't uh, let people in and so forth. So I think, I know DOT loves these roundabouts. They just well, when you have a 75% reduction in crashes that are of, of ma a large magnitude and in injuries, I can see why you love them. Yeah. But they do, they're a challenge. Uh, from my observation, uh, a lot of people like because they're going straight into them, they think they can keep straight going or going right <clears> into them. But you really do need to yield to anybody who's in that circle. Right. And so they're, it's in lieu of the stoplight, you're kind of yielding is what you're doing. But somebody who thinks that they can go hell mm -hmm. bent through this through, thing, gonna there's going to be a problem. Yeah. So well, you know, I've, I've, I went through the 28 and 32, you mm -hmm. know, just. Uh, that one's simple. That one's really pretty straightforward and actually, yeah. Things work really pretty well. I thought when we started with the Rotary on 8th in Indiana, I thought for sure that was just going to be mass chaos. But actually, it's, it's been very, rational. very safe. I don't think there have yeah. been They're common many. in Europe. Yeah. Yes. Europe does not go into the right angle stoplight and sit and <laughs> idle for, you know, that's not their mentality. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Americans have to change, I think. All right. So speaking forward for change, um, let's talk about, uh, speaking of changes, um, not so much in our tax rates. We finally have a state budget, um, and we'll be talking a little bit about that in our next, probably talking a lot, a lot about that in our next uh, show. But uh, the impact that it's had locally, I note the county board uh, kept its tax levy not only equal, I think it dropped a little bit, and, which would make sense because it's not supporting uh, Sunny Ridge any Sunny longer. Ridge anymore. And yep, so yep. one would certainly have expected uh, uh, a tax drop. I'm sure it's maybe not as big as people expected. The school district is going up, um, is going up. Uh, after various adjustments because of the budget delays and so forth. It's my understanding 4.2 percent. I don't know how much of that is from the referenda. Uh, I don't either, but I know that when they went to the public, the projections they shared with the public was that spending was going to go up for a little while because of that building referendum. Mm -hmm. I don't, and I have not seen yet, interestingly enough, we should have gotten well, well over a month ago the third Friday numbers shared with us. Um, the third Friday of September is when we stop the clock and count all the kids and that determines to a certain degree our state aid. 
and that's usually been shared with us. So I don't know what our really our enrollment numbers are. We were projected to be right around the same number, maybe a little bit higher, maybe a couple of dozen students more. Puts us around 10,000 um, students, so you've got the state aids based on that, among other things. Mm -hmm. um, but um, we are, um, the numbers I did see last year were we had more students from economically disadvantaged backgrounds, more students with ELL needs, more special ed students. Sure. Um, and those students typically have smaller classes, so um, I haven't had a chance to pay much attention to the budget because it was just approved. What, last week, and I really haven't seen the breakdown. Normally, they work; they mm -hmm. walk us through the budget at various administrators' meetings and things, and that doesn't happen this year for whatever reason. Hmm. And I think uh, governmental budgets are, that are kept in line are uh, you, you <clears> have to give a credit to a lot of the people who are putting those numbers together because just fuel costs for vehicles, uh, heating costs. Yeah. We all know from our personal lives, you know, what that has done. We're not talking about two to three percent. We're talking big percentage increases over the last year or two in those items. And I think what the public sometimes forgets is when you build large field houses, mm -hmm. they have to be lit and heated. That's well, right. or large police stations. And I know stations. the district, yeah, and I know the district has spent considerable time and energy. Gene Casper, um, in his retirement, has been given the project of really working at having the district in other areas use less energy. Uh, when you start talking about the hundreds of classrooms in the district and the number of computers and printers mm -hmm. and all the types of um, of electronic needs, we've been really been focusing on turning things off. We now have sensor-driven lights so that if there's any oh, sure. if there isn't any motion in the classroom, those lights go off and they don't go back on until somebody walks back in the room. And I know there's been some considerable savings there, which will help offset the increases in the new facilities. But whether that's a wash, I, I really I'm not quite sure yet. Well, that leads to the um, the mayor's discussion. Um, a drop in state revenue puts the city budget at $330,000 in the hole. And uh, that's new because I think Mayor Perez had come up with a budget that really did hold the line just to the, to the um, either a flat tax rate um, or the increase that was allowed under state law, which is only 2%. Um, now, because of the way um, the revenues are coming into the state. There's a $330,000 um, hole, which is tough. Um, mm -hmm. There's a proposal to sell a couple of buildings that the city owes, the little um, little red schoolhouse. I didn't know the city owned that, but uh, apparently mm -hmm. it does, and it also owns the old. Um, I think it used to be the old Girl Scout building right down on, on the lake on Broughton mm -hmm. Drive mm -hmm. uh, that has housed the Literacy Council now for some years, I think. I've never been inside, just a cute little building. They think that those buildings together, they're getting them appraised, might be 200,000 uh, or whatever, but it's hard when you're trying to hold the line at, at the budget that you want to, and yet you've added police officers. Um, just all the costs that you've talked about, Cal, that just keep going along no matter what we do. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there is a move afoot um, in the city and county. Um, and certainly in the school district to really look at how do we do business? And do we have to look at a cutback in services or can we look at how we restructure and reconfigure services? And, uh, and so from my perspective, you know, that makes all the sense in the world, but um, it's tough. Any thoughts on whether the mayor can find uh, 330 grand someplace? I don't know, I heard Gisho say that uh, he doesn't want to uh, raise the taxes, he'd rather do a borrowing, I think, uh, and then use that to offset the operating expense and then uh, pay back through, through the borrowing, I guess. Well, it's not unusual <coughs> for municipalities these days to take a hard look at how they finance their debt. And mm -hmm. Sheboygan has a huge, I mean, through past borrowings, I mean, our debt limit is I mean, we're actually approaching the top of our of our debt ceiling. We view the water coming up to our noses, and we're just barely staying above. Not quite that bad, but if you can refinance and, and look again through your financial consultants on just ways to restructure. I mean, essentially, it's a refinance, and, mm -hmm. you know, we do it for our houses. Why not do it for, for government uh, entities? And they, they do do that, and it makes some sense. And... Um, Taking money from the vehicle replacement repair fund to um, to pay down the pension liability, I think, is a terrific idea. 
I know the school district did that. Yep. Yes, we did a while ago. So you're, you're not paying out the terrific amount of interest that the state exacts from you, as it should, for this unfunded liability. So I think, I think all those ideas make sense. But As an aside, this is really, since you mentioned finance, I know that the city was looking for a finance director. This is kind of off topic what mm -hmm. we're talking about, but it's finance. Mm -hmm. Do you have any uh, knowledge about where they are in, the, uh, in their search for a finance director? Have they hired somebody? They have not hired anybody. Um, there have been interviews with any number of candidates and some have been plausible, some good candidates, but nobody to date has accepted the job. Uh, so whoever has been offered has not accepted. So I think, um, okay. I think they're really back to starting over again with that. And wow. Well, that, that's it's a challenging job. When you look at the real estate market today and what might be in there in the future, if property values don't continue to increase as they have, which has always been a goose that was laying golden eggs. Exactly. I mean, one of the reasons for the deficit that the mayor says that they're facing is industrial values decreasing or flattening out. Well, if the housing crisis is, is, continues the way it is, we're going to see other values decrease and that's not going to bode well for the next budget crunchers mm -hmm. in the years ahead. Yeah. I think the mayor is at that point where he is able to um, work with people that um, his folks, you know, there's always turnover and it's, it's somewhat slow at the city level, but they're going to be looking for an HR director, for the finance director, and then as I understand it, they've reconfigured the um, information technology position uh, I don't know how, but uh, uh, you know, currently a very high paid position, kind of looking at how mm -hmm. that gets handled in, in the table of organization and so forth. Um, but that all takes a huge, as you folks know, I mean hiring is just a huge and incredibly important <laughs> part of the job that you do in, I, I think, in any entity, whether it's private or public, you just have to have good folks, so. And then I'll switch again. We have a new fire woman. We do <laughs> a new fire woman. We do. So you don't want to talk about taxes anymore? Well, no, I, don't happy, talk about taxes. I am happy to talk about the. Um, I was. I had the honor of attending the swearing-in of the new um, uh, Sheboygan's first woman firefighter, and uh, I am uh, Chief uh, Jay Les Tusky, who did a very nice job at the swearing-in yesterday. And those are always nice ceremonies. You have families and <coughs> members of the force and the mayor and the, you know people just coming in to wish the, the new people well. As a member of the Police and Fire Commission some years ago, I kept saying, just find one woman <laughs> for us to interview. Just one. That's all I need. And even if we don't hire her, just to know that we have been able to to, to interview uh -huh. one woman. Well, Jay came in and said, not only did we interview, this woman was um, really at the top of the list. And uh, so she was clearly the most qualified candidate. And the lists tend to be fairly long. And uh, there was another woman who was down the list somewhat and you know, past the hiring cutoff, but, uh, but was also well qualified. And so it was a great swearing in. And uh, I, I met, um, Ms. Zemke, I think her name is, briefly, and uh, just offered her my congratulations. I think it's a... Marilyn, how does that work? Um, is there a, a period where people apply, they take obviously some sort of an academic or mental test of some kind or another, and there's a physical test, mm -hmm. and then those that pass go on a list and then they wait for openings to occur, or do we wait for retirements and we go through it every time there's a vacancy in the department? There are a variety of ways of handling it, but at least when I left police and fire, um, they would create a list and they would do testing of 30, 40, 50 people mm -hmm. and create the list based on really fairly objective criteria um, in terms of the physical strength tests, endurance tests, um, knowledge tests. Of course, now they're only hiring paramedics, the, the fire department. Because in the past, you did not have to be a you did not have to be a paramedic. Yeah, but I mean, as far as physical strength and so on, which would open up to maybe more women who don't have the bulk that maybe is necessary to, to do the physical The test. physical, I mean, the physical strength is obviously a key piece of it, but as the newspaper article pointed out, and it, and it was my understanding of the physical test, it's not the raw amount that you can lift, it's how, 
it's how you lift and under Technique. what circumstances and you know can you crawl down a pipe and pull somebody out that sort of thing and um, and women can succeed at those those tests so according to the paper she was a volunteer fireman woman or so to speak in, Mani in Mani Manitowoc uh -huh. yeah. for 10 years and mm -hmm. uh, she was uh, I guess when they moved uh, she and her husband moved here she mm -hmm. kind of gave it up so she's happy to be back. She's age 41 too, mm -hmm. so that's, usually you think of hiring a fireman age 25, 26, but now you're hiring somebody yeah. age 41, so that's kind of a coup also. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> so I think, uh, I think it's, a great, uh, it's a great thing. So those lists exist, and then if there are vacancies, they can pull up people from the list. Usually they're in place for a year or two. Police do that too, I think, in, in various permutations, so um, at least when I left, that's the way they were doing it. And the Police and Fire Commission interviews, which was very interesting to me, all of these candidates. And uh, part of the statutory requirements of the Police and Fire Commission, created, I think, years and years ago when it was really who you knew and mm -hmm. how you knew people that got you a job as a firefighter or a police officer, mm -hmm. which were considered plum positions in, mm -hmm. the, in the early 1900s and so forth. So I think... Uh, so I think that's, it's a new era. That's a new era, that is yeah. correct. Yeah. And as the chief said, well, she's the first woman firefighter today, but from now on it's, it's not such a big deal. And I, I would agree with that, although it'll be interesting just yeah, Where to, is she going to stay? Yeah. <laughs> How is she, she going to be housed? Has she been assigned a particular station yet? I, I don't think so. Okay. I think she was still going to be doing some training and so forth. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing, all of the firefighters that apply these days, number one, they're all pretty well educated and college graduates are not at all unusual. And second, um, every single firefighter that I ever interviewed was an EMT, which is certainly less of a skill level than a paramedic, but um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, clearly the firefighters are, are learning those skills and of course, Come January 1st with our new fire uh, well, yeah, department. Isn't, uh, uh, what's your name, Janet or Jane? Uh, Lemke. Zemke or? Zemke. Zemke or something. But anyway, she's, a, she's according to the paper, she worked for Orange Cross. So yeah. she, is a, yep. she is a paramedic. She's mm -hmm. a fully trained paramedic. Yep. Yep. And who's done that sort of thing before. Yeah. So well, 80% nice. of firefighter calls these days are, are EMT calls or medical calls. They're not mm -hmm. fire calls. Yeah. So, so that's a good thing but uh, in any event. Um, a consultant has been hired by the city to develop a plan to revive the flagging commercial corridor on Taylor Drive. I didn't realize that Blockbuster Video is gone, as mm -hmm. well as Walmart and The Pig and Hardee's. Hardee's, I didn't realize Hardee's was gone. Hardee's yep. is gone too. Century. I was just uh, there <clears throat> today. I went over Do to you, Book World, um, which is still up and going. It used to be called Little Professors, and now it's Book World. Because you I had really went out to Hardee's. I know. No, I did not. He did. I did not. <laughs> and hard, I stopped at uh, uh, the bagel, I does, uh, stopped bagel, the bagel shop, place bagel for, uh, for a salad to go. <laughs> and they had, uh, it was about 11 o'clock or so, and uh, coming off a excruciating administrative meeting. <laughs> and, uh, you needed more I needed some Hardee's. roughage. I needed some roughage. <laughs> I needed more roughage, so I was uh, over there. And they had six down or seven. So we aren't taking they off the air here. Seven. They had six or seven people in there. But yeah, it is really pretty much a ghost town up there. There isn't. I mean, there's a yeah. cost cutters and there's a few things up there. Um, Batteries Plus and yeah, Community and Bank is anchoring the other end, the south end of that. Which yes. is a little more thriving. It's got right Culvers uh, and a Culvers Rogan store yeah, and, and the shoe, shoe store. store. But the, mm -hmm. yeah, it is a ghost town up there almost. Yeah. And there are implications that Shopco might pull out. Um, oh, really? oh, that really? if the the concern is if the, this whole corridor across the street is dead, you know, Shopco is right across the street from that. Although I think Shopco must do well mm -hmm. in terms of its vicinity to the. Um, it has well. its own yeah. vacancies. It's You've funny had... just how things shift, you yes. know, from downtown out to. Mm -hmm. What's mall. sad about it is that the, it's still commercial, but it just keeps on moving. It isn't. It, it's sort of poor land use planning. I mean, when you consider all the volume of buildings that are just sitting there empty, and that you know could be better used if maybe we used our, I don't know, maybe a little more discipline, I guess, in how we considered where we we're going to let commercial development occur. Oh. It just kind of bounces around, you know. Let's take our last few minutes to talk a little bit about. Um, the cable franchise bill. We've got four minutes left. 
and maybe we'll need to carry this over into our into our next episode. But the assembly has passed uh, Assembly Bill 207, which uh, basically changes f cable franchising as we know it. And we've talked about this before mm -hmm. because we are the recipients uh, of funding. Uh, the reason that we're here, dear listeners, is that uh, the city and the um, has money from cable companies that pay a, a certain uh, fee to the city in order to be able to be the, the franchisee. Um, it appears uh, the vote has not taken place in the Senate, and I don't really know what the governor is going to do with it. I wrote to um, uh, our Assemblyman Terry Van Akron uh, urging him to vote against the bill, and he did. Not because of me, I, I don't really expect, but in any event, I was glad to hear that he, uh, that he had uh, voted against it. Um, We've talked about it pretty extensively. I don't think it's any better than it was. Um, certainly, uh, AT&T has spent uh, more than $250,000 on its 15 lobbyists. And that it much is, more on its TV ads, uh, which are couched to be consumer advocacy type yeah. ads, but behind <clears throat> it, you know, and there's somebody's yep. special interest being <clears throat> promoted. Yeah. Has anybody heard what the governor might do on this? Yeah. I have not. I yeah. don't know. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what the Senate does because there are several uh, Democrats uh, in, in the majority caucus who would like to see the bill amended to be more like the Illinois plan, which is passed, which preserves the community television aspect of it. And so those amendments will be on the floor on Thursday, uh, this Thursday, as we uh, are making this program. But I don't know exactly where the votes will be because there are Democrats like Senator Playley and Senator Decker who have sort of signed on to the AT&T version, I guess, that came out of finance, came out of the assembly. Yeah. It, it will be interesting to see because I think a, a big, big chunk of the funding for Channel 8 and the studio out here comes from the local cable TV stations or the local cable company, rather. It's not local. Huge international company, but it's local focus here. And um, the opposition says that competition is good that there is not that competition now because there are these local franchises. It seems to me, however, if you have a state franchise, oh. the ability of local people to influence rates and so forth is, I don't know, what do you think, Tom? Well, I can't imagine going to the state and, you know, for complaints. Uh, it just seems so remote and it'll take forever to, to happen. And I guess that's, uh, that's what's going to, the out, outcome. Now, I was asking Scott to, uh, about, how does that affect charter? Can they do they have to opt in, or can they just still run their uh, local uh, franchise? And I guess they have a choice. They uh, they could uh, decide to still operate their local franchise, but I don't know what that means. Right. Well, stay tuned. So, um, it'll be interesting to see what happens, and sooner or later, if this bill does pass, the Donahue Group and all the fine programming here may just kind of fade into the. Uh, fade into the woodwork. But, well, you'll have, uh, we'll have a new name, the AT&T Group. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking quickly about what AT&T could stand yeah, for. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to sell the naming rights naming for this rights, program. Yeah. <laughs> but AT&T was canvassing our neighborhood, seeking, um, really pushing uh, for us to sign on to the totally, you know, the three package, the combination oh, of yeah. wireless internet, television, and telephone. Well, we're going to wind up, but thank you all for a lively conversation. We enjoyed it.